Hi folks, welcome to part six of our mini lectures on the muscular system. In this lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about the function of specific components of muscle contraction and then zoom back out to the big picture. So if you think about the process of beginning a muscle contraction, right? There are a couple things that have to happen. You need to have an action potential in a motor neuron that leads to acetylcholine release. You have to have functional acetylcholine receptors on the motor end plate. The T tubules have to be able to conduct that action, muscle action potential deep into the cell because that excitation, those action potentials are coupled to contraction by the release of calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Once calcium is released, it binds to troponin, which pulls tropomyosin off of the actin of the thin filament, and that allows for the formation of cross bridges in the beginning of contraction. To end a contraction, a number of things have to happen. The acetylcholine needs to be removed from the synapse. Right there are two with in this particular example, there are two ways that the synapse is cleared. One is diffusion. The acetylcholine will diffuse away from the synaptic cleft. Um, but the more, more important mechanism is in, involves an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. Don't worry about the name. It's, essentially, it's an enzyme that breaks acetylcholine into two pieces, neither of which can stimulate the receptor, right? So that will eventually lead to a lack of action potential in the muscle fiber because the receptors aren't being stimulated. That in turn is going to close those voltage sensitive channels that have been allowing calcium to flood into the sarcoplasm. The sarcoplasmic reticulum at that point also starts active pumping of calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and that's an um, active transport. It's a molecular pump. Once the calcium is out of the sarcoplasm, the tropomyosin is able to slide back to its resting position. So it covers the binding sites on the actin, which means that cross bridges can no longer form. Now, if you've had binding of a fresh ATP molecule to the myosin head, then the muscle is capable of relaxing and it returns to its resting length. All right, so now let's talk about the specific function of the myosin cross bridges. ATP hydrolysis, right, which it's a hydrolysis reaction, just like we talked about with biochemistry. You need a single water molecule for each ATP molecule that you need to break down. So, ATP hydrolysis leads to cocking of the myosin head, essentially setting it into the active position. If calcium is present, that ATP hydrolysis sets up the formation of cross bridges and also as it's the ADP is released, it leads to the power stroke. Now, if you don't have additional ATP, you're going to end up having the cross bridge 
stay bridged. It's that uh, those two are going to stay bound together. Um, and in fact, that's what happens um, after um, we die. That's what leads to rigor mortis, which I'll talk about in just a second. The function of calcium in muscle contraction is to couple excitation, the action potential in the muscle fiber, which is electrical and involves the movement of sodium and potassium ions, to shortening of the sarcomere, which is what contraction is. So here we've got our thin, up close view of the thin filament. The orangey red ovals represent the actin, and then we've got the tropomyosin in green and the troponin complex in blue. If calcium is present, right, pro these are all proteins except for the calcium. When things, when molecules bind to proteins, proteins often change shape. And in this case, when calcium binds to the troponin complex, it changes shape, which causes the tropomyosin that it's connected to to change shape. And that leads to the binding sites that myosin is attracted to and the actin being uncovered. All right, back to ATP. I should put this a little earlier. Um, as I said, ATP is needed, a fresh molecule of ATP is needed to break the cross bridges. Um, after we die, right, our, what we think of as the death, our death is the death of us as an organism, but is not the same as the death of all of our cells. They don't all die at the same time, which is why you can talk about brain death as opposed to um, liver death, <laughs> I suppose. Um, our muscle cells are capable of producing a limited amount of ATP even after we stop breathing, right? Remember, skeletal muscle cells possess um, myoglobin, which binds oxygen. And so you can, there's a little bit of capacity for aerobic respiration in skeletal muscle after death. But there's also the ability to do anaerobic respiration, right? Essentially fermentation. Um, and so that will allow muscles to continue to contract and relax. But eventually, that ability is exhausted. You can't even do anaerobic respiration anymore. Um, and that's what's responsible for rigor mortis. ATP, you, you can't regenerate ADP into ATP anymore. And so the cross bridges stay intact. Right, that's what leads to rigor mortis, which literally means the stiffness of death. It doesn't happen immediately after we die because, as I just said, you've got ATP production for a while after um, an individual human is dead. Um, and it doesn't last forever um, either because eventually bacteria that are present um, in the body will start to break the um, muscle cells down. And once the sarcolemma, the plasma membrane, is broken down, um, then the muscles, essentially the muscle tissue, will um, be consumed by bacteria. So you don't have the stiffness anymore. So here's sort of a big... When a neuron stimulates a muscle cell, over the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. The action potential releases internal stores of calcium that flow through the muscle cell and trigger a contraction. Muscle cells have an elaborate architecture that allows them to distribute calcium ions quickly throughout the cytosol.
deep tubular invaginations of the plasma membrane, called T-tubules, crisscross the cell. When the cell is stimulated, a wave of depolarization, that is, an action potential, spreads from the synapse over the plasma membrane and via the T-tubules deep into the cell. A voltage-sensitive protein in these membranes opens a calcium release channel in the adjacent sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is the major calcium store in muscle cells, thereby releasing a burst of calcium ions all throughout the cytosol of the cell. Within a contractile bundle of a muscle cell, called a myofibril, the calcium interacts with protein filaments to trigger contraction. In each contracting unit, or sarcomere, thin actin and thick myosin filaments are juxtaposed, but cannot interact in the absence of calcium. This is because myosin binding sites on the actin filaments are all covered by a rod-shaped protein called tropomyosin. A calcium-sensitive complex, called troponin, is attached to the end of each tropomyosin molecule. When calcium floods the cell, troponin binds to it, moving tropomyosin off the myosin binding sites. Opening the myosin binding site on the actin filaments allows the myosin motors to crawl along the actin, resulting in a contraction of the muscle fiber. Calcium is then quickly returned to the sarcoplasmic reticulum by the action of a calcium pump. Without calcium, myosin releases actin, and the filaments slide back to their original positions. All right. So back to the big picture. Muscle contraction. When you think about muscle contraction, or contraction of the whole muscle, you want to remember the idea of the motor unit. A motor unit is defined as a single motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers that it innervates, right, that it contacts. And because of this type of structure, right, where you have a single motor neuron and for most of our muscles, far more than a single muscle fiber being controlled, what happens is that all of the, right, you have multiple muscle fibers contacted at the same time. All of the muscle fibers in the same motor unit are going to fire at the same time. Right? And that's why you can record the activity of muscles from outside the body using what are called electromyographs. Now, that the size of motor units, meaning essentially how many muscle fibers are innervated by a single motor neuron, that is going to be different depending on the function of the muscle. So in muscles like our uh, ocular muscles, the muscles in our fingertips, the size of the motor unit is incredibly small. Sometimes it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Whereas in large muscles like the um, quadriceps femoris or the rectus femoris, gluteus maximus, our biceps, you might have 2,000 muscle fibers innervated by a single motor neuron. When we talk about muscle twitches, we don't mean sort of the we're not thinking of a twitch in the same way that maybe you've been thinking of it, right? A muscle twitch is defined as contraction of the muscle fibers in a single motor unit. And each twitch lasts only a fraction of a second. And each one has, each twitch has three parts. So you have force, which is another, right? Force is produced by shortening of the um, 
muscle fibers that are in the motor unit. You've got time on the x-axis here. So you have a stimulus. This would represent the firing of the motor neuron and release of acetylcholine. Notice that nothing happens for a while. That's called the latent period. And that's because all of the molecular things that we've been talking about have to take place before the sarcomeres and so the myofibrils and so the muscle fibers and so the muscle start to contract. You have this period of muscle contraction which reaches some peak depending on the size of the motor unit. And then you have relaxation until you're back to baseline. In order for us to generate muscle tone, right, which is, um, which we all demonstrate all of the time, it's responsible for posture, um, and even actually, even when we're sleeping, we have muscle tone. Um, that's the result of the continuous partial contraction of muscles. So you have the stimulation here of different motor units, right? Each of the different colored lines represents a different motor unit. And because of this pattern of firing, if we were to measure the force generated, right, essentially how toned the muscle was, it's going to be it's going to appear to be constant, even though, or I suppose it is constant, even though it's the result of successive motor units firing. Now, if you are not thinking just about muscle tone, but about using your muscles to do some particular activity, right? particularly an activity that is um, that requires a lot of muscle strength. Right? We have the, a process that's called summation, which is an increase in contraction that occurs because you have more and more motor units recruited until you reach what we call tetanus. Tetanus and this use of the term just means sustained maximal contraction of the muscle. Um, the disease that we refer to as tetanus happens because the bacteria that produce tetanus toxin lead to, um, they interfere with the neuromuscular junction and that leads to tetanus, meaning sustained contraction. Now, unless you have um, been infected with those bacteria, eventually you can't maintain tetanus anymore and you end up with muscle fatigue. So even though right, you're continuing to stimulate the muscle, at some point the motor neurons are not capable and the muscle itself is not capable of responding rapidly enough. All right, and then I just, finally, I wanted to show you this um, really cool GIF. Um, you can download it here if you would like. Um, and one of the things I really love about this is that it takes you from gross anatomy all the way down to what's happening within a single sarcomere here. Um, if you download it, you'd be able to see there's actually a key hidden underneath here um, <clears throat> that lays out exactly what's happening. So you've got aerobic respiration over here, you've got the action potential, neurotransmitter release, action potential down our T tubules, release of calcium, yada, yada, yada. All right, and that is your guide to
the muscular system. 